Welcome to our second Conservation Conversations. You're in for a real treat tonight. Many of us have been in lockdown and spent more time with our pets. And I bet you're starting to notice that your dog and cat are a bit smarter than you used to think. Well, we've known that for a little while. We know that dogs have a whole lot of senses that are different to ours as humans. And that's why we've enlisted the help of detection dogs to help with our fight against extinction. This is an incredibly exciting and innovative program. And every month we're learning more about what these amazing dogs can do. So sit back, relax, grab your dog and enjoy this cutting edge conversation. Hello everyone. And welcome to this second installment of the Conservation Conversation webinar. My name's Chris Hartnett and I'm a Threatened Species Project Officer within Zoos Victoria's Wildlife Conservation and Science Department. Tonight we'll take you on a journey with the Zoos Victoria Detection Dog Team and tell you more about how dogs are helping in the, cons in the conservation of some of Victoria's most threatened species. For those who tuned in to last week's webinar on the mountain pygmy possum, you'll know this is a pretty relaxed affair. It gives us a chance to sit down together, have a cuppa or a night and listen to some great conservation stories. It was lovely to hear from Darcy last week after the session that people had been in touch to say how much they enjoyed connecting with Suze Victoria while they were cooking or eating dinner at home. Before we start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands across Australia on which we're meeting tonight and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. So tonight you'll be hearing from me about Suze Victoria's first steps into the world of conservation detection dogs followed by our wonderful wildlife detection dog officers, Dr. Latoya Jamison and Naomi Hodgins. They'll share more stories about Zoos Victoria's current activities and some really exciting future plans with detection dogs. Hi, Latoya. Hi, Naomi. Hi. Hi, Chris. How, How are you going? Good evening. Yeah, great. Good to be tucked up it's inside It's great to tonight. come together. <laughs> Absolutely. And talking about dogs, our favourite subject. Absolutely. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone, tonight there'll be about 45 to 50 minutes of discussion followed by an opportunity to ask some questions, but please feel free to post any of your questions or comments throughout the conversation. If you look to the right of your screen, you'll see a little button that says Q&A. If you click on that, it will take you to the chat. Also, as we share presentations, you'll see a toggle or a little um, sliding tool that you can adjust. So you can adjust the, si the size of the presenter or the presentation as you'd like. So I'd also just like to acknowledge some very special people who I know are joining us tonight. The donors and the conservation partners that support us at Zoos Victoria. This support enables us to be bold and innovative and curious in our mission to fight extinction. So a big thank you for the belief you have in us and the work we do. As everyone out there hears more about Zeus Victoria's detection dogs, I hope you'll feel inspired to support the program with a donation, big or small, so that this and other important conservation work can continue. There'll be some more information at the end of the presentations on how you can donate. So thank you everyone for joining us and I'll get the ball rolling on introductions to the detection dog team with a little bit of background about how we all came to be here. So I'm just going to share a screen with you. Okay. Perfect. We can see that, Chris. You can see that. Great. Thank you. So currently I'm working in my dream job as a Threatened Species Project Officer with Zoos Victoria. But before working in conservation, I spent around 12 years working as an artist. The broad theme of my artwork over that time was nature and the complex interactions we have with it. But over time, I became more aware of the precarious situation of many species on this planet, and I narrowed my focus to advancing the status of non-human animals. I figured if we truly value all species, we'd do everything we could to ensure they thrive into the future. I know art can be used to deliver powerful messages, but I came to the point where there was a kind of sense of urgency about species extinction, and that made me want to work more on the front line. So I made the shift to science. And that meant going back to uni. I first enrolled in the Bachelor of Science where the maths and chemistry nearly killed me. And I then went on to complete a Master of Science in Zoology. 
And in my master's research, I investigated female mate choice to improve captive breeding outcomes in this beautiful species that many of you will know and love, the Eastern Barred Bandicoot. So I went from drawing animals to working directly to aid the conservation of rare and often cryptic species, the ones that many may never see in the wild but can hopefully still value and support. And I'm constantly aware of what a privilege this is. It was during my master's study that I first worked with the Zoos Victoria community, including researchers, keepers and educators. And it was so exciting to meet a group of people that shared my passion for a future rich in wildlife. Of course, this community extends beyond the zoo walls to all of you joining us tonight. So I continued working with Zoos Victoria after I completed my master's study. And I've been lucky enough to work on programs for a number of our priority threatened species including the Eastern Barred Bandicoot, of course, the Mountain Pygmy Possum, Lead Beater's Possum and Orange Valley Parrot. In 2016, I was thrilled to be asked to lead the first phase of Zoos Victoria's Detection Dog Program. And since then, it's been an amazing and really joyful journey. We've come ahead by leaps and bounds. And a really significant step was the recruitment of the two canine specialists, Latoya and Naomi, that I'll hand over to now. So over to you, Latoya. Thank you, Chris. So unlike Chris, I don't have a creative bone in my body. None of you would be impressed by my drawings. My background is actually research and science. So I did a wildlife science degree at the University of Queensland. And then during this course, I had an opportunity to go on a trip to South Africa. And that was a life-changing experience. And it was over there that I first saw wildlife detection dogs in action. And I was absolutely blown away. I remember our course leader telling me that he could physically see me shaking. I was so excited after seeing my very first demonstration. So after coming back to Australia, I began planning for my honours project, which I was lucky enough to do with a qual detection dog team. And then I continued on my research to do my PhD which focused on exploring um, how we are currently selecting detection dogs and the impact of their dog handler. And then during this time um, for my PhD research, I adopted my very first dog, who is the cheeky monster on screen there. Her name is Arwen. She's not a professional detection dog. She's unemployed, but she has done detection work in the past. And for those projects, she was trained to detect Tiger, Red Panda, and Black Buck Scat. And we do hope to use her for future Zoos Victoria projects, research projects only though. And then in April last year, I scored my dream job by some miracle with my work wife, Naomi. So I'll pass you on to her now. Thanks, Latoya. It wasn't a miracle, you weren't it. You're amazing. <laughs> um, thanks everyone. Uh, so my background is, Similar in that I also started in science. I was studying wildlife biology in Queensland um, when I became interested in wildlife detection dogs. So I was studying wildlife biology and at the same time, I had recently rescued my first dog who was a mess. He was the dog in the pound quivering in the back of his run um, bald terrible mange and he was the one I was I said I want to look at that dog and and the, the shelter staff said no no you don't you don't want that dog and I was like okay bring him out because I'm stubborn and <laughs> and so he came home and I worked really hard on rehabilitating him from the the messed up little creature that he was um, around the same time I was also volunteering on a project um, looking for koalas in the Queensland bush and we were wandering around for days and days and days. We had to find the koalas to be able to get them out of the trees to collect samples on their reproductive status. And we were driving and walking around the forest looking for these koalas. It's very hard to find them, as many people can probably attest to. And I just kept thinking, surely a dog would be able to do this so much better than we can. And that's where I, the cog started turning. So Charlie had gotten a little bit better and I decided that I would investigate whether there was any opportunity to try detection work with him. And I took, I found the only place that I could 
come in contact with, which was a German Shepherd Club that were doing tracking. Charlie was not a German Shepherd. And I took him along and they did one little exercise with him and they just, no, sorry, it's not going to work. He's not going to be suitable. Um, and that's okay. So he, he, re he recovered really well and lived till he was 16 years old and he had a really good life. He was never a detection dog. But I kept thinking about it anyway. So I finished my degree. I started a family, took some time off to do that. And at the same time, I was still thinking about dog behaviour and training and all of those things. And so I undertook my um, qualification in dog behaviour and training and I became a professional trainer. And I was lucky enough to meet um, Professor Pauline Bennett at the La Trobe University and we started chatting about whether a PhD project in conservation detection dogs might be something we could look into. I knew I had to do honours first, so I started there and I conducted a study looking at the human-animal bond um, and its relationship with training methodology, so how different training styles can affect that human-animal uh, human bond, specifically with dogs. Um, that was wonderful and I'm yet to do that PhD, so we'll, we'll see what happens in the future. Um, about my photo, I've got four dogs here, three of them are mine, Ziggy, Kip and Cisco. And B, the border collie is a ring in. There's usually one or two ring ins at my place, whoever needs somewhere to be. Um, and we've got enough space and we just love having extra dogs around. So um, that's me and a little bit about my background. I'll hand back over to Chris to talk about the origins of our program. Thank you, Naomi. I just love that story about everyone trying to talk you out of taking Charlie and then you just took him anyway. <laughs> you are stubborn. So, I can as I said earlier, <laughs> you two are hilarious together. So, as I said earlier, one of the things that inspires me most about working with Zoos Victoria is that we're always looking at ways to innovate and to expand the tools that we have at our disposal in the fight against extinction. Around the time of preparing our first wildlife conservation master plan about six years ago, we came upon a potentially powerful new ally. We know that the canine has been a best friend to humankind for thousands of years, but their skills have only more recently been harnessed for conservation. This little fella on the screen here, his nose is an olfactory powerhouse. It gives him a sense of smell up to 10,000 times more powerful than ours. So we thought that with some specialised training, this superpower could make him a best friend to threatened wildlife as well. We started looking at the conservation dog literature and we found that detection dogs are being used for a variety of applications around Australia and also around the rest of the world. So some local examples we found included spotted tailed call scat detection. The hawkweed, the hawkweed is an invasive plant and so um, hawkweed detection as part of an eradication project in New South Wales, as well as koala scat detection. And I didn't want to you know, bombard you with stats on my slides, but take it from me, the dogs were the star performers in these programs. All of these studies showed that dogs and their handlers outperformed the human only teams each time. So dogs, for example, um, achieved a consistent detection rate of 100% in controlled assessments where they actually knew where the sample was or the, the um, researchers knew where the sample was and how many were out there. And they also showed greater efficiency and accuracy than the human teams. In the koala scat detection study I've cited here, um, researchers measured the average time to finding a koala scat and they recorded an average of two minutes for the dog teams versus 39 minutes for the human teams. Dogs also searched the entire study site more than 20 times faster than humans, which is probably not a huge surprise to those of you at home who do have a dog and they do at least 20 laps of the dog park before you've done one. The threatened species researchers who spend most of their time or a lot of their time trying to locate rare and elusive species, these are really exciting results. At Zoos Victoria we were inspired by the literature that suggested detection dogs could help us in locating some of the precious and often critically endangered species that we're working towards recovering. And we knew from the studies that looked at detection dogs that they're a great tool, but most of the studies the dogs were detecting traces of animals rather than live animal targets. And they tended to be a focus on mammals. So studies focusing on other taxa like birds or reptiles were relatively rare and using dogs to detect amphibians was almost non-existent. 
Much of our work at Zoos Victoria would require a dog to detect live animals, so in many ways we needed to start from scratch. Our study design would focus on the safety and welfare of any of the species involved, including the target wildlife, non-target animals and the dogs as well. We see them as our highly valued colleagues. So we decided to proceed with a proof of concept study, phase one, to show that dogs could detect threatened species with the Zoos Victoria emphasis on welfare. And after consulting with the threatened species team at Zoos Victoria, we decided that the boar boar frog would be our first search target. We thrive on a challenge at Zoos Victoria, so why wouldn't we choose a species that's tiny? It's as brown as the mud that it burrows up to 30 centimetres down into, and it's found in only one remote location in the world, which is the dense subalpine forest of the Mount Borbor Plateau. So you see that vegetation, that stunningly beautiful habitat of this little brown frog that lives often underground in forest gullies, and it highlights the challenges of surveying in this location. We believed it was worth doing because dogs locating Borbor frogs could help in population surveys, or collecting individuals for captive breeding, which are all important parts of recovering the species in the wild. Finding frogs by smell could help us address the male bias in the traditional survey method, where we rely on locating males through the sound of their calling. And there's limitations on this because males only call for a brief period of the year. Dogs could potentially help us locate females and juveniles who don't call, so that we could bring them into captivity for the conservation breeding program, as well as help us find unknown boar boar frog populations outside the current survey range. And this would help us secure some vital genetics to support the resilience of boar boar frog populations into the future. So the next step was to find a detection dog expert and some dogs that could be trained on the scent of boar boar frog. We were really lucky to find detection dog trainer and handler Luke Edwards of Canada Development, and Luke's experience and insights have added incredible value to our program. His two border collies, Rubble and Uda, that you see in this slide, are brothers. And just like human brothers, there's that whole dynamic going on where little Uda's always keen to impress big brother Rubble. Rubble's a real veteran of the field. He's a search and rescue expert before he became a conservation detection dog. And he's just such a pro. He's always confident, self-contained, methodical, while Uda was a little prone to overexcitement. But I have to say, when Uda was on the scent, everything else seemed to drop away and he really came into his own. So over several months, Luke trained Rubble and Uda on the boar boar frog scent, initially using skin swabs. And then we followed that up with some live animal training where we held the frogs safely in closed containers. I'm just going to show you a video that shows the training set up for the skin swab scent samples, where a sample is placed in one of the containers and the others are empty. You'll see Uda signal the presence of the sample in the container by giving a really clear alert to Luke, and then Uda's rewarded with some delicious dried beef. What I find really amazing is that this is only day two of the dog's training on the scent of Borbor frog. So Lewis, could you play that video for us, please? So that barking you could hear in the background would have been rubble. The dogs always get really excited when they know there's training happening and they just want to have their turn to get a bit impatient. So pretty incredible progress at day two of training, but there was still a lot of work to do before the dogs would be ready to search for bore frogs in the field. And we made it. Here's the detection dog team up at Mount Borbor about six months after training first began. 
On the far left is the amazing Vorpal frog team who monitor this species year after year for weeks at a time in some really challenging conditions. They're a very special mob. In the middle, you can see Luke in full PPE with rubble. And on the right, a very cute and muddy Uda after some enthusiastic searching for frogs. During these successfully located six bore frogs, which we were able to confirm by the sound of male frogs calling from underground at the very point where the dogs had indicated their presence to us. And this was really groundbreaking stuff. And it showed us what huge potential dogs have in conservation. Then we tested Luke Rubble and Uda with an even harder task. We took them to a site where we knew Bobo frogs had been in the past, but there had been no male calling heard here since 2006. Luke and the dogs did a large sweep of the site, but unfortunately didn't make any um, confirmed detections of Bobo frogs here, which didn't really surprise us, but we thought it was worth having a look anyway. I've included this slide because I wanted to show you this map, which I think is fascinating. It shows the search area for the dogs and the way they search. So that red squiggly line is the path taken by the dogs, and that's based on GPS data from their collars. And you can see how thoroughly they've covered the area. They've scanned these primary circular target spots here, like canine vacuum cleaners. And during that survey, the dogs covered about 12 kilometres in some really very beautiful but challenging terrain that you can see on the left there, where Luke's um, struggling over some huge fallen trees. The vegetation is super dense, and the bracken and ferns form a false floor that disguises these deep crevices between enormous granite boulders. It just feels ancient there, and it's incredibly beautiful. I'll always remember a moment when we were making our way up a steep trail to the search site. There wasn't really any trail that I could see, but we were being led by the Borbore frog specialists who knew their way so well they could probably do it blindfolded. They'd be virtually leaping over those giant trees while I sort of had to shimmy over them on my belly. And I had to stop to catch my breath once or twice and started to fall behind. So at one point I looked up and there was not a soul in sight. It was like the forest had just closed in. And I had one of those moments where you think, hmm, I might be in a bit of trouble here. But a few seconds later, just absolute relief as Rubble appeared at the top of the track. He had his head on the side and his tail wagging. And I think having the herding instincts of his breed, the Border Collie, as well as his search and rescue background, there was no way he was letting anyone fall behind. So he doubled back on his own to find me and hurry me along. Such a great dog. We have another video here for you. This was one that was made by our very talented communications team at Zoos Victoria. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about the response to this video uh, when you've watched it. So, Lewis, can we please play the video?
I think I've seen that video at least a dozen times and I get goosebumps every time. Just so rousing. I hope you enjoyed it too. So on this slide here, I just have some stats around the number of views that this series of videos had. So the communications team made a series of three videos. The first one was the one you just watched, introducing the detection dogs. And it was quite a strategic decision um, to introduce Rubble and Uda and Luke and the team to the public first. And then we knew that because people love dogs, that uh, we could use that engagement to really talk about the Borbor frog in the subsequent videos. And as you see, that first video received more than 50,000 views in the first weekend. And the success of the Detection Dog Borbor Frog project in terms of community engage engagement wasn't something we'd fully anticipated. I can certainly post the links to those videos for you as well for those who haven't watched them or like me want to watch them a dozen times. At Zoos Victoria, we know how important it is to tell the stories of vulnerable species and in that way mobilise communities to act in a fight against extinction. So it was amazing when the frog dog story captured the imagination of people across the country. As you can see at the bottom of this slide, the story was also picked up by ABC News nationally, as well as featuring on an educational program for kids called Behind the News or BTN. BTN's aligned with the curriculum and it's watched by primary and early secondary students throughout Australia during school time. So a lot of, if you've got kids at home, pretty much all of them will know about BTN and hopefully a lot of them saw the frog dog story. Follow-up work done by the Zoos Victoria education team found that recognition of the boar boar frog among school children had skyrocketed after watching the news story. About 85% of students recognised the boar boar frog in follow-up visits to schools. So through working with these beautiful dogs towards conservation outcomes, we'd created unprecedented interest in this little brown frog. And this success assured us that detection dog, well, the detection dog program more largely was worthy of ongoing investment. And we began planning for an in-house program to be based at Hillsville Sanctuary. We wanted to have our own specialist staff and zoo owned dogs. So we put out the call for experts in conservation detection dog training and handling and the response was pretty overwhelming. We had people who were willing to move from all over Australia and even internationally to come and be part of this program. Eventually we were able to narrow the field to the two very impressive applicants you've already met tonight, Latoya and Naomi. So I'll hand over to Latoya to take you on the next part of the Zoos Victoria detection dog journey. Thank you, Chris. After now travelling to Mount Borbore myself and spending most of the time falling over or sliding off moss covered logs, I can certainly appreciate why you may have wanted a break or two. Now, hopefully, you can all see my slide. I, so I'd like to, yes? Yes, yes, looking good. <laughs> Wonderful. So if I can take you all back to 2014. There was no peer-reviewed published literature on wildlife detection dogs in Australia, which considering that these dogs have been successfully used for decades overseas, we were wondering why they weren't more common in Australia. But at that time, I wanted to assess for my honours research how amazing these dogs were in simulated trials, so seeing how quickly they can find samples and if they were better than humans, as well as how they would perform in a field scenario. So I was lucky enough to be able to work with Lloyd and Amanda Hancock from Carnarvon Canines and their incredible qual dogs. Barky, who is the dog on the left, and Kuna, who is the little black dog with the white tooties on the far right. And I'm pretty amazed that they actually allowed me to come along for all these cool trips, considering at that stage in my life, I'd never owned a dog, I'd never trained a dog, and all I'd really done is attempted to steal a friend's dogs and take them for a walk. So I spent several months volunteering a couple of days a week at an adoption facility, trying to work with and handle as many dogs as I could. And I just dove into reading as many training books as I could and learning as much as I could before I started this whole process. Throughout the year, both the dogs and the handlers absolutely amazed me. The dog teams were able to survey large areas and locate 
really small target samples that were often several years old in only a few minutes. But it was in the field and not the simulated trials where the dog handler teams really shone. During a survey for northern quolls in the Mount Moffat section of Carnarvon National Park, which is approximately a day's drive west of Brisbane, depending on how fast you drive. And in this area, they hadn't seen northern quolls in over a decade. And this is based on human visual surveys, camera trapping and cage trapping. So this population of northern quolls was believed to be extinct regionally in that area. And we weren't too sure if the dogs would be able to find them. And if they could find them, would they even be anything there? But on the very first day of our surveying, the dogs were able to find a few samples of fresh northern quoll scat. And in case you don't know what scat is, it's feces, it's poo. And poo may not be very exciting to you, but for researchers and ecologists, it's, uh, it's what we want and strive for in all of our field surveys, because it means that the animal that we've been searching for is actually there. So after having this amazing honours year, I then had so many questions that I'm like, why not do a PhD? How hard can it be? So for my PhD, I wanted to explore what kind of dogs that we should be using for wildlife detection work and why we seem to favour so many specific breeds over others, when in my mind, most dogs have pretty incredible noses, as Chris has already mentioned. And I also wanted to explore the impact that the dog handler and their dog and handler bond has on a dog's welfare and working performance, since it was becoming fairly common practice for one person to train a dog and yet another person to either purchase the dog or to handle the dog. So I decided that it was a brilliant idea that over nine months I would train 12 dogs um, from three different breeds and I was caring for them seven days a week as if they were my own little babies. And I was comparing Labradors, Border Collies, and Greyhounds. Yes, Greyhounds for detection work. And I was looking at how quickly these dogs could be trained, their behaviors, and then at the end of their training, how accurate they were at scent detection work. And my results were fairly surprising. Well, for some people, it wouldn't be too surprising if you owned a Border Collie. I found that that was the breed that was trained the quickest. But what you might be surprised to find out, that my one greyhound that completed training out of the whole group actually had higher detection success rates than half of my Labradors and a quarter of my Border Collies. So maybe it's not about the dog breed, it's actually just about the certain dog that you're working for or working with. So I found those results really interesting. And then I wanted to determine the impact that that dog handler relationship has on their dogs and their work and performance. So to do that, I introduced them to a new handler, Anne, who had experience handling and training dogs and who was familiar with all of the cues I learned and had provided her with a brief bio and all of my puppies and their little quirks. So I went into this expecting that my really confident dogs who had been working really well for me would then transfer really easily to another handler and work beautifully for them. I was wrong. Rosie, my chocolate border collie at the top there, was a really confident dog. She performed with 100% detection success in all of her assessments with me. However, with Anne, she scored zero. She basically refused to work and would just trot along, looking in the sky, doing nothing. Whereas my more timid dogs, such as Berkey, the chocolate Labrador on the right, she actually worked perfectly for Anne and also scored 100% in her assessments, just like she had with me. So it was really interesting to see that individual variation between how certain dogs would perform with a new handler. So to us, that really highlighted the importance of the dog handler relationship and that bond and trust between the dog and their handler. I should also note that with their unfamiliar handler, the dog's stress levels were actually increased based on their behaviours. So it's not only important from a working point of view to have a really good dog handler bond, but also for the dog's welfare. And with that information in mind, we've now included that 
in how we train and manage our Zoos Victoria detection dogs because our dogs have to work both for myself and for Naomi. So these dogs that we currently have on screen are Roy, who is the Black Labrador, and Kip, who Naomi mentioned before, is the Rescue Red Kelpie. And watch this space because we might soon be hearing the pitter patter of little feet as our pack expands. Thank you, Latoya. It's beautiful to see how much the dogs really enjoy their training. I was talking with our animal um, training specialist, Sue, um, and she actually, Roy is Sue's dog, and she was telling me that when she's bringing Roy to the sanctuary to train, he just seems to be absolutely besotted with Latoya. So he starts getting really excited once they approach the gates of the sanctuary and he's just looking around, where's Latoya, where's Latoya? And as soon as he spots you, Latoya, Sue says she just be like, see you, mum, I'm hanging out with Latoya now, you can go. <laughs> the feeling's it's mutual. It's just so lovely. <laughs> So dogs and their handlers can um, develop a really close bond, obviously. And Naomi, can you tell us a bit more about that from the work you've done? Absolutely. Um, so what I didn't talk about earlier was that um, as part of my relationship with Latrobe University, can you guys see that slide? Hopefully that's a yes. Yep. Let me know if you can't see it. Cool. That's perfect. Um, as part of Sorry our Sorry to jump in though. I think there is a video of Roy that we need to show off, him being super special. Oh, let's, let's do that. I'm so sorry. Yeah, cool. Hang on. I'll share that with you. Yeah, we don't want everyone to miss out on that. That's too good. You need, you need to see beautiful Roy for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so, Lewis, can we please the video of Roy on his scent search. So sometimes the dogs are very excited and then other times it's the handler that gets really excited. But my excitement was warranted because that was his, basically his first time doing that kind of work. Anyway, I'll stop being a proud dog mum. Please, Naomi. <laughs> <laughs> I was pretty, pretty excited by that one as well, I'll, I'll be honest. Now my, my PowerPoint's disappeared, so give me one second to bring it back up again. Let me know when you can see this. Like it's opening. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Technology. Love it. So, that was my um, fault. I threw you. No, <laughs> we, we've touched on a few things that um, really, I guess, strengthen my theories on detection dogs and, um, and, and what we do and don't know and what, what, what's to be learned. Um, and a couple of things that I can really, really um, reiterate from what Chris and Latoya have spoken about is um, the importance of the human-animal bond um, in in terms of that ability to work together as a team, but also the lack of importance on breed necessarily. So I really, really enjoyed Latoya's research because it, it really told me what I thought I already knew about the fact that breed wasn't so important, but it was about the individual dog um, and also that bond between the dog and the handler. Um, I was lucky enough to work on a project with Latrobe University um, for a PhD student, Nick Rudder, um, who was, um, piloting a program where we were using citizen science detection dog teams. So training pet owners and their dogs together to do wildlife detection. Um, this is an ongoing project and, and it was just such a privilege for me to be able to be involved in. Um, within this, we saw such incredible strengthening of the relationship between dogs and their owners. 
but also strengthening of the relationship between the owners and their understanding of conservation um, and, and then how that fed onto the community. So like Chris was talking about earlier, the community engagement is vital in conservation and we all know that. And, and dogs are a beautiful tool to be able to connect the stories about conservation, particularly in our own backyards and, and people love to hear about it. So going backwards a little bit, um, at the, at the start of my training journey in specifically wildlife detection dog um, training, I was lucky enough to be mentored by Luke Edwards, who was in the in the earlier videos, and we were working on a project to develop um, detection dogs for turtle nest monitoring. This was for a project um, in northern Victoria where the endangered broad-shelled turtle is having its nest raided by foxes and predating on all the eggs, which means there's no recruitment into the system of baby turtles, like you can see in the top right. Um, and this is this is basically wiping out the species slowly because they're so long lived. So it's hard to hard to see what's actually happening, but um, but it's, it's pretty serious. So um, whilst doing this project, I really realised that I couldn't do it by myself. I needed we needed a lot of people on the ground when these turtles nested to be able to have some success in 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 actually protecting the species. And I felt like this was the perfect fit for our um, citizen science detection dog teams. Um, just on the photos on the left, there is Kip and myself, and that's Kip's first nest that he found. Um, whilst on a training exercise he we were, we set up a training exercise and I knew where everything was and he went off and alerted somewhere else and told me there was a nest where I wasn't aware there was a nest and and lo and behold there was he was right and so we were lucky enough to go back to that nest one year later with Turtles Australia um, with Graham Stockfeld who is just the pioneer in this area of turtle conservation and citizen science up up in northern Victoria and we were able to check that nest and there were, were hatched baby turtles waiting to emerge. Um, they often wait for the rain to emerge and we were able to release them safely and send them on their journey into the lagoon. So that's one of the babies up in the top right there, which was, it was just amazing. I can't tell you how excited I was. And then we've been lucky enough to also develop some other projects um, for our citizen science teams. I should also mention that it's National Volunteer Week and we should really, really um, applaud the volunteers working in all sorts of areas around conservation. Um, our volunteers are just lucky enough they get to use their dogs as well. So it's, um, it's a pretty cool gig. Um, this project that we worked on was in the Alpine regions of Victoria, where we were looking for something called the Alpine stonefly. That's it in the top left. The Alpine stonefly is, has um, a number of subspecies across the mountain tops of the Alpine region of Victoria. And, and in, in some of those areas, it is highly endangered. So particularly the Mount Buller um, subspecies, amongst others, is, is really of concern. The researcher who focuses her career on, on researching these insects he, um, contacted Nick at La Trobe University and, and we worked on a program to develop um, detection dogs for her project. We were lucky enough to take the team. We've got um, Judd and Baya and Sasha there that you can see in the photo on the top right and Baya again down the bottom. And we had a wonderful opportunity to train all of the dogs at Falls Creek, where the species there is less of concern. And so there's, it's still a concern, but there's known populations that were perfect for us to train on. We were able to really fine tune the dogs training and, and they really got to understand exactly what it was we were looking for. They were incredible. And within that, we also were able to look at the insect and make sure that we weren't causing any stress to the insect. So we were able to monitor the stress levels of the insect, which is really important to us. I'll talk a bit more about that later. Um, and then we took them across to Mount Buller and we were tested whether they could um, detect a different subspecies and the results, they were looking good. They'll be more um, published on that in the future by Nick, um, but we were really, really happy with the outcomes of, of that project and there'll hopefully be more to come. Naomi, do you just want to yeah. double check that your screen is sharing? I think a few people ah. are having issues. Interesting. Let me try. I'm I'll just try it again. I'm seeing it from here, Naomi, Interesting. if that helps. Thank you. 
I'm just going to close it down and I'll reshare it. Oh no, there's so, such good pictures. So this is why we work with dogs and not with technology. <laughs> <laughs> We're not IT specialists. That is true. <laughs> How will I find out if people can see this now? Can you see it, Latoya and Chris? I can, I can see, see it. it. Okay. Well, that's a good start. Let's, <laughs> let's go with that. <laughs> we'll, we'll carry on. I'll paint a picture so that you can visualize it as well. <laughs> um, and I also do have, um, I do have a little chat forum open. So if anyone wants to get in touch with me through the chat forum, they can give me any alerts. Thank you. That's a good idea. So the final project I was wanting to talk about was um, looking for the elusive greater glider. So we were training the dogs on greater glider scat. Greater glider is our largest arboreal marsupial outside of koalas in Victoria. And it is really, really critically um, threatened, um, particularly its fire habitat loss, etc. And we we decided that it would be a worthwhile project to work on, and, and we're building, still building this project. So there's there's hopefully more to come. Um, what was amazing in this one is little Dusty. I love I love little Dusty up in the top right hand corner. Hopefully you can all see him because he's absolutely gorgeous, and he and his owner Bridget had a beautiful relationship but Dusty was lacking in some confidence. He really initially struggled to even move away from her for a couple of metres and then as as he really started to learn the game of the sense detection training and, and understand what we were looking for, he just thrived. He just started becoming a little bit more confident, a little bit more confident until the day that we, he just came out guns a-blazing. He was like um, a little rock star, came out guns a-blazing did all the things, passed all his assessments. He was so accurate and he just looked like he was having the best time. And then we were able to take him out into the field and he found greater glider scat under inches of leaf litter, um, which obviously we didn't know was there and we had to verify by scraping back the leaf litter to try and find it. And he was he convinced us and it was definitely there. So that was just such a beautiful um, moment. It's probably one of my favourite moments actually of working with these teams. Um, and I, I guess I wanted to then move into the Zoos Victoria program. So we've talked about how we got here and the things that we've worked on. And, and it's, I think it's really important to talk about, um, going back to this slide, the welfare side of things. So welfare is, it's not just about the um, conservation and the endangered species for us. It, that's high in our priority, but the welfare of all of the animals that we're working around. So the dogs, the species that were there, they're searching for, but also the rest of the environment and the animals in that environment that we're working around. Um, and so this is a massive focus for us in, and we, we intend to be really public about um, how we ensure our dogs' welfare and also all of the other animals we work with. And we're really excited to share those stories with you. Welfare also comes into some of the projects that we've already selected. So one of the projects that we're working on at the moment is whether dogs can be used in a captive breeding program of Tasmanian devils. Can dogs tell us when the devils are in estrus, ready for mating? Or can they tell us when they're lactating um, so that we know that they've got pouch young and need to be managed differently, given more food, etc. And so at the moment, um, there's no way of knowing that without physically handling the devils. And that's probably not great welfare for the keepers or the devils. Um, but it, but it's important for the conservation of the species. So we're hopeful that we'll be able to enhance that program in that way. We're also looking at um, a project on frog detection and generalization of odor and whether we can train on more common species and then transfer dogs onto endangered species where we might not be able to obtain scent samples that um, Chris talked about when we were talking about the boar boar frog training. And of course, the beautiful Plains Wanderer, which hopefully you're all familiar with. That's another project that we're looking at developing further from that pilot program. So that's a little bit about us and our future and, um, and what we're planning on working on. And I think we're planning on going to some q and I really hope that you could see my slides and, um, and I'll pass over to Chris for some questions. Yes, so um, please everyone, we've got about 
10 more minutes to go, so if you do want to post any questions, you're very welcome through that Q&A tab. Um, I do have a question here right now. I might ask you this one, Naomi. This has come from Estelle, inexperienced dog learn. Is it ideal to work with two dogs together? And further to that, what is the ideal pack size? Oh, that's a really <laughs> big question. Um, I love it. So ideal pack size, I really think that you would be assessing what you're capable of um, doing in terms of providing ultimate welfare for the dogs that you're working for. Um, and and so our, for us, our pack size selection is really about what can we achieve where our dogs have maximum welfare and also they get to work. So we don't want dogs left in left behind um, whilst, whilst other dogs are necessarily going out for work. So we, or when I say work, I, it's really a game. They love it, and it's it's more of a um, detection game than anything else. Um, so pack size for us is what do we need to effectively answer the questions of our biologists, but also what can we ensure that we don't slip on any welfare. And so, and for us, it's going to be a fairly small team until until the program grows. Um, but but yeah, they're they're the questions that we ask ourselves when we're looking at numbers of dogs. In terms of dogs learning from each other, that's really cool. There are studies that definitely demonstrate that um, puppies especially will learn from their mothers when they're working. So there were studies set up in kennels, I can't remember what country it was in, but they basically had the puppies watching their mothers work in detection and, and train, and then they compared them to puppies that hadn't, and there was a huge improvement in the, in the pups that had, been, had the opportunity to watch their mums work, which is gorgeous. Um, we certainly incorporate that with our dogs. They do get frustrated, but I do think that they also learn. And, and so part of it is that balance of, is it right for the individual dog and how you manage them so that all of the outcomes are good for everybody. Hope that answers that Fantastic. question. <laughs> sure did. Okay, so I have um, another question from Luke, which is how many dogs are in action? So I can quickly answer that, Luke. At the moment, we have the beautiful Kip, we have Roy, and as we said earlier, or we hinted at, there may be some news about an exciting ex expansion to the program soon. Um, the next question, so Dan has asked, do the dogs react differently to each FE species scent? Do they have a favourite? I love that. Favorite <laughs> do they have a favourite? An a awesome Latoya. question. <laughs> it is an awesome question. When I was training my dogs during my PhD, they were detecting tiger scat. And a lot of them were actually really afraid of it when they were first smelling it. I really had to encourage them that all was well, that if you find this, you get amazing food and games. So I, I haven't noticed anything like that, but it's a very cool question. It'd be interesting to yeah. look at more. Yeah, I, I guess when we trained, um, when we added subsequent odours for all of the dogs I've worked with, I haven't noticed a massive difference in motivation for one target over another, I think, because the game's the same and ultimately the reward isn't that odour, it's what you get from telling us that that odour is there. So it's more the reward is the game at the end of the alert. Um, so I think that that probably means that it's fairly consistent unless they have a, a particularly aversive reaction to, to the odour, which I have heard of before too. <laughs> it's so interesting um, when you talk about that game, it's as if you know, to be a good trainer and handler, you have to be uh, able to get inside the mind of a dog and work out what motivates them. That's really <laughs> yeah, cool. Absolutely. Yeah, that's part of the development of the bond too, understanding what it is that it's going to be different for every dog and for us there's not one answer it's whatever that dog thinks is motivating enough that's what it'll get and that's what we'll use yep just Great. adapting to whatever's in front of you fantastic i've got another question from molly um, and latoya i think this one's perfect for you based on the work you did in your phd can any breed of dog become a conservation dog yes yes absolutely Yes. <laughs> any dog yes, yes, has the, yes. <laughs> yes. Any dog has the scenting <laughs> capabilities to do whether it's just scent work as a game or professional detection. As long as they have the physical and behavioural traits that we're looking for, 
then I don't really care what breed or shape or form it comes in, as long as they're healthy and motivated to do the job that we want and are really engaged with us and are safe around wildlife. So I probably wouldn't be taking a St. Bernard up a mountain and then at risk it gets hurt and I have to carry it back down, but <laughs> I'll take it. I'll take them all. He could save us when we fall into those granite crevices at Mount Bulba though. Yeah, when we're falling off logs. Andy. Great. Okay. Well, we're getting quite close. Was... Oh, sorry. Go on. No, that's all right. I was just wanted to share. There was there's a um, chihuahua in the US um, that is working on a project uh, where basically the chihuahua gets backpacked into the remote location because <laughs> he would he wouldn't probably make it of his own fruition, but he's excellent at the detection work um, once he gets there. So yeah, who knows? Maybe I can jump in your backpack. You'd be good at Mount Bobo. Bobo. <laughs> <laughs> Chihuahua could really get into some of those those crevices. Yeah, I quite like that, that one. That's awesome. <laughs> So thank you so much. We're getting close to seven o'clock now um, and I have one piece of really important information to share with you. So I'm just going to share my screen again. So now that the Zoos Victoria Detection Dog Team has really come together, we've got our expert trainers and handlers, Latoya and Naomi. We've got some very clever dogs who love to work. And we've also got fantastic research partners like Latrobe University. So it really feels like the sky is the limit for this program. I hope tonight you got a sense of all the amazing possibilities for detection dogs and conservation. And with your support, we're going to keep exploring these possibilities for a whole range of threatened species. If you can, please support the work we're doing at Zoos Victoria with a donation. You can first link you see on this slide. And for those in a position to offer the next level of support with a larger donation, we'd really love you to become one of our conservation partners and you can follow the link here on the slide. So that brings us to the end of tonight's conservation conversation. Thank you so much for everyone for joining us. I have to apologise, we did have some um, issues with connectivity. So if you missed any of the presentation, we will be supplying a link so that you can watch the presentation again and we will put that up tomorrow on our website. So we hope you fell just a little bit more in love with detection dogs. We hope you feel as excited as we do about their role in conservation. And if you haven't already, don't forget to register for next week's webinar, where we'll be hearing some great international conservation stories from Dr. Chris Banks. He's the head of Zoos Victoria's international programs. So thank you again, everyone, for joining us. Thank you.